It's time for episode 385 of the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. That's right, Lars. That's right, my friend. Huh? Wow. Wow. Huh? Someone's, yeah. t- someone's stepping up. Someone's da- stepping up to the plate. Daddy brought gifts. That's <laughs> right. Yes, 385, where I find out I'm Lars Fredrickson's sloppy second podcast host, and it hurts a little bit. I thought that was your first. No, you're my second. I'm on, you know, the guest today is an old friend of mine, known him for a few decades, Mr. Rob Naylor. Before you say anything, Rob, let me just give everybody an introduction to you. I've, we've been wanting to have Rob on the show for the longest time because, you know, back in the tape trader days, Rob was, you know, a very prominent figure in that. And he used to make his own comps. And, you know, the way that the one of the things that I wanted to bring up, because the, the today's modern fan is a lot like we were back in, you know, 25 years ago. But now but and there was such a small number of us and Rob was, you know, being the forefront. But of course, um, you know, Rob and I and, and Will and uh, had a, a, a we did a little podcast with our friend CM Punk and what, 15 years ago, Rob? long time ago yeah, yeah. Maybe 2008 9 10 whatever it would be yeah yeah i mean i think because that was right before his match with who again well john cena we have one right before the famous money in the bank match which right. would have been awesome like the timing of getting that group of people together to talk about randy macho man savage was huge and right. then the file was corrupted and no one ever saw or heard of it so it's fine it's okay we did other ones though that were good too so sorry. we did we did but rob's an old good friend of mine and and i normally we have like a pro wrestler or somebody you know but rob's obviously been in the work in in the wrestling business i wanted to, i just had this idea let's have a fan show and talk about being a fan you know because that's what who listens to wrestling podcasts is, is fans so with that i digress ladies and gentlemen mr rob naylor welcome to the show hey. rob. all right hey thanks for having me on guys appreciate it and with that, I got to jump right in because uh, I think Lars and I are both know that we are so lucky to know the people we know, to have seen some of the things, whether it's, you know, in a stadium or backstage or just being around the people. When you go from iconic tape trader, which you kind of were, you know, I would I I through through Lars, I learned so much about the tape trading because I was not part of it. I was I was that. If it didn't pop on TV, I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't even a dirt sheet guy. That's how naive of a wrestling fan I was. So you're one of those few people in 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 the tape trading industry that goes from tape trading to being part of the industry. Now, hang on, hang on. I don't really want to get so much into it, but what was that moment like when you go, oh, my gosh, I'm stepping across that line onto the field of dreams? That's a good question, but I wasn't a tape – this we got to – we gotta lay this out too. I was more a tape buyer. Like I tape traded. Like let's face it, I was a tape buyer because by the time I got into it, there were so many human beings that went to the observer readers' pages and they had their own little cottage industries out of their own homes, or they just had they lived in a certain area and they just had access. Like someone had sports channel, so they had ECW TV, which to me was like you know, manna to the people who believe in, in the world back in 95 and 94. Like, you needed those tapes. I didn't have it where I lived. We lived in the coal region. We didn't have these things. But we had, basically, people in Philly had the ECW TVs. To get back to all that, wrestling tape buyer, occasional trader, and was it cool? Yes, it was ridiculous. And my whole thing was, I was so more starstruck, and Lars, you'll appreciate this, I was always happier when, like, yesterday was my birthday and like Norman Smiley was like, Hey, thanks. He was like, instead of saying, Hey, happy birthday, Rob, he's like, happy birthday for me. And Barry motherfucking Houston was the text. Barry Houston came to FCW. Who the fuck is Barry Houston to most people? He's my favorite. He's this awesome guy. He was this awesome wrestler. One of the first people to do European style. And he did it on worldwide wrestling, which was the D show by that time with the NWO and everything. But a lot of he meant a lot to. A, there were people I know that traded tapes of Barry Houston. Full circle here. So like, when he would stop by the office, it's like, wow, Barry Houston. You know, different people would be like, well, don't mark out. John Cena's coming in. Oh, whatever, it's fine. Hi, John. 
Barry Houston, oh my God. Or, you know, uh, <laughs> Buddy Colt, Legends from the 70s. Oh my gosh, this is great. I'm going to talk to him about everything that happened with Gordon Soley and Dusty and Pac Song Nam and Gary Hart, the whole thing. So that was fun. But I did have to temper my fan because I got pulled into a room when I first got there and kind of yelled at, well, don't be a fucking mark. I don't know if you can curse on this, but don't be a you, mark. You da, 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 da. And, you know, I, I had that in my brain, like, okay, shut this off. Don't sell anything. Just try to be cool. But, like, Vader would come in, and I would get to give Vader DVD compilations that me and Lars's mutual friend – you know, made like a 40 disc Vader comp and the tear would drop Vader's eye. He'd be like, thank you very much. You've worked with my son for a year. And now I'm visiting and you're giving me this. I don't have all these matches or dusty having me make extra copies of my friends. Dusty Rhodes comp that would go to the kids. So like it's, it's VHS and tape trading, but it's also DVD compiling and just collecting and having a network of human beings that all share tapes and come up with ideas for compilations and, and things of that nature. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, 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 that encompasses tape trading. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that, cause I remember some of your comps yeah. and you had, you know, these famous comps in the world, you used to call them the baddies or the. Oh, the wimpies. Wimpies. That's the what it wimpies. was. Yeah, the I have wimpies. a, I have a, Rain Man esque memory for great. Oh, like, squash okay. Hold match. on a second. Okay, okay. You're Rain Man a, a times ten. See, that's the thing, Dennis. Yeah. Is okay. I can call Rob and I can or I can text him. I say, hey, I'm watching Liger versus Mysterio or whatever, and he'll say, well, what match was it? September '84 or <laughs> you know March of '96 when it was snowing outside at the Albany <laughs> fucking you know like he knows. And I mean, it's it's kudos to you. Thank you. Um, but yes, so go ahead. Uh, explain yeah, it's the like baddies. Only for the older stuff. Only for like the 80s and 90s and like 70s stuff. But modern stuff, I don't know that well. And yeah, I had the Wimpies because like could, I would have like, oh, okay, Undertaker against Al Reynolds. Great. Or I'd have, you know, Zan Panzer against me, Mark Callis in October 1990. Got it. You know, Yokozuna against uh, Dan Dubiel was a classic job guy. And he thinks he had some kind of issue with his ribs where like Yoko could sit on him full time and like destroy him and not land on his feet first. But he survived it somehow. Was it a condition? I don't know. These are the medical things I worry about at night. Not like my own health or an EKG. Does Dan Dupiel have some kind of structure in his rib cage that allows him to take bonsai drops better? These are the important things we think about. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I had cops. I would pick my favorite matches from all over the place in all days and times. There's a guy named Bill Schneider who was, who is, he yeah. writes now for The Ringer and he's a really great guy. And I've been to shows with him for years, but he had comps before I did. And he had them on DeathValleyDriver.com, and he put these compilations together. And it took, and we got to talk about this, it took forever. This day of now, give me what I want, I need to consume it immediately. Phil would write out stuff for his tape list and be like, oh, well, here's Tenru and this person, and here's this Michinoku, Michinoku 8-man, and here's this Mako Satsumura rookie year match, and here's this... 70s schnooka flare match and like he would get detailed write-ups he's like oh i can't wait to get that tape and you'd send him 20 bucks and like eight months later maybe you'd get a fourth generation version of all these matches and you'd be excited it was part of it there wasn't that immediate gratification of oh my god i need it right now you waited for it and then when you got things you kind of appreciated a little bit more I don't want to go all old man over here yelling at the clouds, but I feel now a lot of times people just like they're ready to shit on something before it even is finished because they just want to be like, oh, well, you know, I saw this last week and it was better than this or everything is available on YouTube. If YouTube was around when I was a kid, it'd be bad. I wouldn't have yeah. learned anything. I would have just, I would have been focused on watching wrestling on YouTube all day long. <laughs> so. Well, we've, we've had Phil on the show be, uh, promoting his Way of the Blade book. Yeah. And, and that's another guy I wanted to mention. I, I, sorry to cut you off, but, you know, just the idea of how much time it took to go around and collect these matches um, and just that, like you were talking about, that excitement of finally getting it after, mm -hmm. you know, such and such a time. But just having that documented, it, it, you know, that that was like the best feeling in a lot in a lot of ways. In, in my, that was in the my best. Opinion. Go into the mailbox, and I did this recently. 
I haven't collected anything for wrestling in the longest time. But in the 90s, I would order that Best of Sabu tape, and I would order the Best of the Headhunters in Wing, and I would order all these tapes, and my poor parents had all this shit coming to their house 24-7. <laughs> like, because I, I had a part-time job on weekends at the nursing home. So instead of, like, putting forward my college, I'm like, well, no, I'm going to get this Headhunters tape, and we've got to see what's going to happen with Onita in FMW. So I had stuff coming to the home. And it was awesome. And I'd run to the mailbox and be pissed if the mailman didn't come with my tape. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, fuck you, mailman. But then, like, when you get me great when it's gone and then it'll be okay, fun, we're going to watch. I, have, I haven't had that excitement in years for any kind of commodity. I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. But now I'm into collecting Japanese wrestling magazines. And I'm funneling hundreds of dollars in the year-long Japanese wrestling in 1993, the whole 52 issues. Let's get them in the mail and run to the mailbox and be excited again. So it's coming back for me a little bit. Right. I hope other people have hobbies in their life. If it's not wrestling, maybe like fucking roller derby or whatever else they might like in life. Barbie, whatever it is. But people like things and it comes to your home. You get excited about it and it's tangible. It's a real thing yeah. you can go and collect and have in your hands pop it into a DVD player, you know, just have it. Yes. Now, in my research of you, I came across some stuff where some of the guys in the industry would come to you to critique their matches. Now, I guess my question here is, what were the matches in your head that you would use as a measuring stick for their matches? Okay, so yeah, that's, uh, I don't know about all that. Here's what I'll say about all that. When I worked at NXT, yes, sometimes someone that worked there would be like, hey, you know, someone that might be new. Hey, you've seen a million things. What do you, did you watch this? What do you think of this? Or, you know, I would write what I would do in the 90s or in the 2000s. I would go to every show in the Northeast and I would do my little typewriter write-ups of every show after it happened on message boards. And people would read them. Eventually, I made a lot of friendships at wrestling through that with a lot of great people. So with that, okay. What I like to do, though, is I like to watch a match. Like, the, the whole thing at Developmental, when I first got there, at least, was like, well, everyone watch Ric Flair. Or watch Goldberg. You're a big jacked-up guy. Watch Goldberg. Fuck that. Watch Eric Embry and Buddy Landell instead of Ric Flair. Because everyone's oh, seen Ric Flair. Watch Gino Hernandez. Watch, uh, you know, somebody... Uh, uh, you know, watch Shingo in Japan instead of Gold. What Goldberg's Goldberg? You're not gonna do Goldberg again. Like, right. okay, he had great fire and his intensity. You can watch that if you're new, and you can grasp that and learn from it. But there's other like I could watch any person's body type even and be like, okay, bing, 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 bing. watch this. Here's this idea. And as anyone that could follow my social media, I, I just social media is such an angry place. So all I do is I just put little photos and videos of shit. And you could see, I have a, a, a mind for just picking a clip out, this, that, or the other thing. And even Gary Albright, this awesome wrestler from the 90s. Recently, I just have a friend who has a giant database of 80,000 matches. And I just typed in Albright. And all of a sudden, I pulled up 15 Albright matches. And I know right in the match where the suplex is going to be. So I just go bing, 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 And I just get to throw something together really fun and easy. And then people consume and they enjoy so, you know, just just stuff like that. I like watching wrestling in a way where, hey, that's cool. I haven't seen that in a while. Let's pitch this to my friend via text, you know, and maybe they'll adopt it into their their match in a way, shape, or form that makes sense. So, you know, stuff like that. Well, you know, today's modern wrestling, because, and that was one of the points I wanted to make at the, the beginning of the show, is like, you know, a lot, as, there was a very small world of us who read the dirt sheets you know we're interested in the ratings or you know whatever it may be or what was happening in japan and trying to follow along the story and we were kind of a quote-unquote smart fans right would you i mean is that fair this is my question to you when did you start with all that because i know my exact date now you were more busy than i but in 1993 i got doing? my first observer that, right. yeah Exactly. But, you know, when did you find out that you could even send a mail or a money order to someone to get a tape or trade a tape, Lars? Was it well, later in the 90s? Did you, 2000s? Like, it would, it would, well, when I, that, that was the thing because when I, it was probably 94, 95. 
Wow. Okay. Okay. So, and that's when I just kind of discovered like, you know, and, and where, how I got connected was through eBay. Okay. And, 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 and so you would find guys there selling comp tapes or whatever it was. Yeah. And then sometimes on their pages, they'd say, come to my website. Right. Okay. And then that's how you kind of found it. And then Death Valley driver, yep. and, you know, and the, uh, the bat boy who was a good friend of mine, okay. uh, Brent, you know, yeah. so, so it was like, it was like, I kind of made my way. So by the time the, the, the late nineties came around, I was fully immersed and I knew who to go to, to get certain things, who was dependable, who was going to rip you off. Cause I got ripped off a few times, you know, yeah. there was, yeah. there was, and, and there was that one guy that would always get all the Joshi stuff. Uh, oh, fuck Southern California guy. I forget his name. Um, Bob Barnett. Was it Barnett? It might've been Barnett. Might yeah, be Bob Barnett. It was Bob Barnett because I met him through Vampiro, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so hey, this is and, why me and you can talk for hours because I, I don't know. even know any of these things, but it, I'm enamored by it. You don't even understand. But okay, yeah. so you met Bob Barnett through Vampiro. Yeah, it, and it's just because <laughs> when 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 uh, when Vampiro would do little spot shows down in Mexico or whatever, mm -hmm. he would do a spot show in LA because the LA the flea markets down there would do those little or. Or even in Tijuana, you know, yeah, I mean? was, like Superboy like, and stuff. Exactly. So Vampiro would stay at his house, blah, 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 blah. OK, OK. So um, but today's modern fan, you know, and you have like things like the Observer, probably bigger than it's ever been in, in its history. You know what I mean? We're, we're, or, or people who know about it anyways. Yeah. Um, and then you have guys like Dave Meltzer now on these these retrospectives of wrestlers careers and things yeah. like that um you know obviously um he was one of the guys you know covering the steroid trials and stuff like that through the newsletters and there was another one i forget who he was there was another Wayne killer yeah thank you and um so but now today's modern fan that information those those things like ratings and whatever it is whatever it is that's like part of being the fan now yeah it's like it's like it's so commonplace, whether it's us 25 years ago, there was, it was very small. You know, you could imagine probably- us, Imagine us watching like, you know, Hogan against uh, Big Boss Man in the cage with Zeus at ringside and being like, I wonder what the Nielsen is going to be. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just, we just watch, people now are more complex creatures. And you mentioned Dave Meltzer. The thing is, Dave Meltzer's paper in The Observer used to have a thing called the Reader's Pages where- my parents would probably kill me if they knew at the time, but I'd thrown their address out into that damn observer. I want to see Sabu matches or headhunters and send tape lists to this house. So then George Mayfield. Ah, wow, George Mayf Mayfield's tapes. The man. I yeah. loved him. He lived up the street near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And he had a thing, Lars, where like he sent a tape list and he had a thing where he listed like, 300 matches, Dynamite Kid and Tiger Mask and Slaughter and Patterson and Vader and Takata and, and Steiner's matches and all this stuff. And he would talk about why he liked each match. Sabu and Funk at the WWN tapings that were never released, the bootleg pro shot. You know, so all these words we would read, like, oh, wow, that sounds cool. And you'd pick and choose all the different things. Jushin Liger, Pegasus Kid. I remember the first one I did. I wrote it on a little index card and I sent it away. And like five weeks later, I got this tape to my house and I was like, holy shit, I didn't know it could be like this. And at the end of the tape, George put a, a Super Jacob video, just a highlight video of the show. So then I had to get that too. So like some of these people were very, very smart the way they would market their own businesses. And uh, then like all these, I get tapeless from Japan. Steve Freelander was a name I remember. John McAdam is a guy who has a podcast about the fandom that we're talking about today in the 80s. I'm talking 70s and 80s smart mark fans, which I don't know anything about. I'm 90s and 2000s. I'm old yeah. enough. But there's a whole thing ahead of me. People were trading beta tapes, for Christ's sake. I don't even know what a beta tape is, really. I, I was a VHS guy. So, like, there's this, every generation has its own thing. And was I'm going May on a rant. But well, I no, just, but was it But was it Mayfield who you paid 10 bucks to have him FedEx his list? And it was like a fucking uh, phone book? Who was that? No, I think that was Friedlander. And it okay. was the one where I these see these guys. The, the, one of the reasons I have glasses 
It's because I've got that fucking tape list from that guy, and it's the most <laughs> minute little. You can't even like Billy Black and Joel Beat and Beat the Fantastics in nineteen. And you're you got my bifocal the fuck out. I, I tried to read, but like it was a very thorough tape list. I don't know how he did it. It was incredible. It was like an encyclopedia. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, was like ten bucks. It was ten bucks. <laughs> ten of ten bucks, and then he FedExed you this book. <laughs> it's basically a book. Oh, and you would nuts. Have to, it was like so overwhelming, even as a as a as a, a pro wrestling fan, because there's like, I don't even know where to start. You know, <laughs> there were I mean? hunchback, there were hunchback mailmen in Campbell, California, and Shimoka, <laughs> Pennsylvania, in the '90s. I assure you, just because of that fucking guy's list, it was but, crazy. Yeah, that was funny. You know, I, I want to jump in and ask because we're in a culture now where things get recycled. What is old is new again. Could you see a version of this tape trading industry come back in? in? Yes. And what it is, you know, it's already here and it's called Google Drive. Mm -hmm. And just recently, Google now has only people that know or don't know google now only allows as of this month a certain amount of terabytes where it was unlimited i had friends that had like eighty thousand matches on google drive specific with years dates names the whole thing so if i wanted to watch like a pretty boy doug summers match or 13 i could type that in and immediately boom every pretty boy doug summers match in the history of mankind will come up on this thing and that's where I could brag and say, oh, well, fuck these newfangled ways of sharing this stuff. I want a physical DVD and the fun of coming up with a compilation on my own and putting a musical thing behind the DVD and having a, a list of matches you can go one by one on the DVD. But now, as from a compartmentalization standpoint, all oh, these drives are cool because basically someone could just get all this stuff, rip it, upload it. Like with me now, shit, I'm not going to name names, but like, I'll put together a best of Yoshino or a best of Judy Martin or a best of, uh, you know, not Bam Bam Bigelow, but someone like that. And I'll, I'll have these little lists of all these different people. And I'll just say, or, or Bobby Heath and Jimmy Hart matches. And I'll just send them to my friends in wrestling's email. And then they'll immediately have my little folder of matches for that wrestler. And it's like, watch these, pick up something if you can. If not, just try to enjoy whatever. Nick Bockwinkle. That's someone I want to send around because Nick Bockwinkle's a guy who did everything so well and he didn't do much. But like, that's the point. Everything he did looked awesome and he had good timing and he had good pacing of his matches and he put things together great. He was a great touring world champion. But he, I've watched Nick Bockwinkle over, and I'm a moves guy. I watch him over half of the shit you see on TV these days with all the cool stuff happening because his shit was just clean and it looked good. Now, let me ask you this, because I'm lucky I slid in the Lars's DMs was like, look, I do this with these guys. Would you come on? And we became friends after that. Okay. You were in a different era. When did you realize, holy fuck, is that that's the guy from Rancid? Oh, my God. Well, that's the thing, too. I, I have obviously Rob, Rob, hang I, was... on. I see the look on his face, but I asked this because in my mind, you're ta trading tapes and you've got this really cool name, like, you know, Roots 97 or whatever. <laughs> and then, and, and you can live behind Roots this wall 97. of anonymity, you know, well, he, he's, he and I were became friends because we you know, our mutual buddy. He's just like, listen, you're a giant nerd. I have another giant nerd wrestling friend and you guys will be fast friends and get along. And he just made the introduction. I'm pretty sheepish. I did email the nature boy, Buddy Landell, back in 2000. And I was like, hey, buddy, I have a bunch of tapes of yours. He's like, hey, baby, send it this way. I live in more free, more Freesboro, Tennessee or whatever. And I remember I was so happy because I met Buddy Landell, right? It was like the coolest thing. And then Loki's another one back in the day because he was Loki 99. He crushed something. And I sent it to him. He's like, thank you very much for what you sent along to me. I will take it and cherish it forever. And I'm like, oh, hey, great, you know? Thanks. So, like, you know, even in his very calm, composed way, he seemed appreciative. But through that, you know, that's the fun of this, too. Email and now Twitter, let's face it. Twitter is like everybody having your phone number. But, like, back in the day, just through email, if you just got a hold of somebody and you could just hit them up about a shared hobby like this. There's so many people that watch or enjoy this hobby we all have. And you could watch it in one or two ways. You could watch it and just shit and bitch and moan and fuss about everything and i've been guilty of it too at times so i'm not going to say like oh i'm up here on the pedestal but like ultimately at the end of the day if you want to remain and stay a wrestling fan 
holy shit, there's enough things out there to keep you very interested, current or past. Like, that's me now. I, I now go to the 90s and 2000s and collect Japanese wrestling magazines because I've read about all these matches, but now I get these Sports Illustrate, Illustrated style photos of all these classic matches, and it's a real blast just to, to go back in and watch stuff of that nature. But again, I uh, just to pitch something at Lars again. So here's one for you. <laughs> When you were watching, and this is off-topic surprise, but when you were watching ECW in the 90s, if you did, and at the end they had Stonecutter Media, or they'd have Tommy Boy Records, were you, as someone who was in the music business, because I would get these tapes in the mail, were you like, bullshit, they don't have deals with these record companies? Like, you probably had more know-how, like... Well, you know, I think at that time, you know, ECW, I mean... I'm not too sure if they had the rights to play these songs. And a lot of that didn't really come in. I mean, I know that's always been there, but yeah. I'm sure that like, you know, it's kind of like getting your music played at a baseball stadium. You get paid for that, right? Okay. So so you get paid no matter what. So, and I don't necessarily know if it was ECW's necessarily their responsibility. It might've been the, the, uh, the station or something. I don't really yeah. know how the, the, they might have struck a deal. Who knows? You know what I mean? I think they so, did with House of Pain because House of Pain, they had, they had the video clips and the Illuminators video and they would plug it and the record company. Well, but then they would just put other shit. You, you know they didn't have a deal with Guns N' Roses or Geffen Records. Like there, There's stuff like that where you're just like, wow, they really didn't give a fuck. Like They're just putting this stuff on TV well, because there was a line in the sand in 86 or 87 where, like, Coco Beware stopped coming out to Morris Day in the time, and he had his right, own right. song. And then, you know, even Dusty, who would have, like, George Thurgood and, you know, yeah. Manhattan Transfer and all these bands, ELO, for Christ's sake. So they had these bands for the wrestlers, and then all of a sudden they all had stock themes. And you just wonder, like, well. Well, that's because there was money in that for Vince. And yeah. that's really what, you know, he had a songwriter. You know, mm -hmm. obviously he had the hit with uh, Real American. Yes. I mean, then that was what originally for fucking Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah. You know? Because yeah. Hogan's theme was by Mona Flambe or whatever. Right. And it's actually <laughs> Cindy Lauper's stage name or some shit. But here's one. I thought that Derringer for Demolition's theme should have got a Grammy. And I also thought Coco <laughs> Beware... And pile driver, what a piece of art! I love that one too. I uh, I think these people just because they're wrestling, they got shortchanged. But you know, who am I to say with my musical ear? But I really did like Derringer's song. Well, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about, Rob, is because you know you just said something pretty interesting, and it reminded me of this question I wanted to talk to you about. Is just about how the fans now. It's like now it's fans of companies and the companies can do no wrong. Right. And it's like, there's, it, it seems like it's less and less about the wrestling. It's more and more about who your allegiance is to. Right. So do you see that in the modern fan of these days? I mean, you got so many ways to consume wrestling. You got so many ways to consume wrestling news. It's instant gratification. Do you feel like, it, you know, as a fan and a lover of all pro wrestling, because I can find something good in even the shits, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that a wrestling fan can, but now it's to the point where it's like, it's like, like you were talking about that line in the sand. Yeah. I mean, I think we all have phases and here's my thing. The fan has always been like that. Here's a story. In 1987, my friend Michael Long invited me over to his family's home to watch Prism, which had the Philadelphia Spectrum WWF shows on it. So it's like the killer bees against Moondog Rex and Barrio and all this other stuff. But we're sitting there watching it, and I'm just like, oh, well, did you see what happened with Dusty this week? Or, wow, you know, that Rock and Roll Express Manny Fernandez Rick Rude match sure was good. And this kid's Uncle Bob, I remember the name. Uncle Bob was like, ah, those guys are a bunch of hacks. They ain't nobody. That's that nobody small time shit. They ain't WWE or WWF. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. I'm like eight. And this guy's treating me like a piece of shit because I like NWA, right? So I just always remember thinking, you prick. And then I always, my whole life, always tried to be a little, be nicer, kinder, gentler. And I liked ECW though. And I probably was a little brat once upon a decade because I was probably like, oh, that's, 
that cartoon shit, WWF, I like ECW. I probably was like that too. But now, now there's just, we see more stuff and it's just like every week the rating comes out and you can go through the ratings of WrestleNomics. There's, and underneath it will be like, oh, Big W or Hey Losers. Because it's people now who just attach themselves to winners and losers or whoever else they want. And they're winners and losers are now professional wrestling companies. And it's like, okay, you go, pal. Way to go. But, you know, I kind of get it. It's kind of now like a like a baseball team or a football team where you just have people who are like, oh, I'm a WWE homer and I love it. And yay. And or I like AEW. And I just think since there's two, you're just going to have this a lot. Whereas, you know, back in the God, even a year or two ago, I would post it, but I would like go, yeah, that was awesome. I really like that. And then all of a sudden, it'd be like 800, or not 800, there'd be like eight people just like saying shitty stuff and like being combative and angry. And I'm like, oh man, what is this shit? So then I eventually just had my Twitter where if I make a comment, you have to either I follow you or you follow me and you can say something underneath it. So who's got the time for this shit? It's a fun hobby. Like yeah. if you're going to comment something to me, make it constructive. Let's enjoy something or discuss or debate. But if you're just going to come on here and be like, hey, dickhead, then it's like, okay, great, cool, see you. So, like, there's some of that. It, it's just, but again, I'm in my fucking 40s. Like, I'm not a kid anymore. I think kids consume and speak and and have emotions different than less older folk. So maybe that's part of it, too. But I just don't have any time for people in the comments anymore to come up and bitch and moan and complain because it's like i don't go to your page and start jumping in on shit so don't come on mine and just be angry because it's a tuesday <laughs> when do you think that shift happened in the wrestling fan because kind of like you said growing up i was a wcw nwa guy i didn't watch much wwf i kind of missed the whole attitude era i think i jumped over when jericho finally kind of made the jump and, but I was a loyal guy, but I wasn't going around talking shit to my friends that love WWE. <laughs> and, and, you know, was was that culture in wrestling before Twitter or did Twitter usher in that culture? It has always been. I have a friend who was watching wrestling at the Hamburg Field House in the 70s. And he'd go in and his mother would look across the wasteland of fans ready for the big WWF taping and she'd go, Son, this is the bottom third of the bottom third. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. So, like, yes, yeah, so let's face it. Wrestling fans have been kind of crusty and, and douchebags and everything their whole lives. But I don't want to say it's all wrestling fans. Any fandom where you're that hardcore into it, you're going to get some people who are just curmudgeons, who are just angry every second of their day. And that's fine. But, like, I do think that... Now with social media, it's all you see more of it, obviously. Like if you didn't come in contact with these people back in the day, they weren't you didn't have to pay them no mind. Whereas now you either have to hit mute, block otherwise, or mute words on your Twitter or whatever, and you just see less of it. Like I would I love it when I could just jump on Twitter and get in an engaging discussion or, or about, you know you know, 80s AWA or, or Continental or anything else. Well, now instead of that, because that just doesn't happen much. Now I just have like five or six friends I could call up on the phone, break it down to them and have that happen. Because I, I just don't think a lot of times it's just very basic thought that ruled. Well, why did it rule? Please, let's talk, not debate. I'm not burying your favorite. But now it's more just like that person's my favorite. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. And, you know, it, it's like, it, it is not unlike any kind of fandom for sports. Like, whether you like the Eagles, or you like this or that, you know, I just think different people watch for different reasons. And I think Lars and I both agree, fuck the Eagles, so. <laughs> I, love, I, I like the Eagles. I like the Eagles when Randall Cunningham was on the Eagles, though. So I, I don't like the Eagles in a long, long time. I couldn't tell you much. About it. Well, I, I I was thinking the band, so I was completely <laughs> lost out of that. So, oh, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, I forget about the Philadelphia Eagles. Although I'm glad that they did win that Super Bowl that one time. Um, but I do remember Oakland Oakland handing them their ass in what 1980. There you go. Yes, back when when was John Madden their coach? Was that 19, maybe the 70s? No, 70s, 70s. But uh, you know. 
as, as we as we as there's so much to consume here and I, w- I was thinking like about the google drives and you know how i'm getting hip to all that stuff now through you and through phil and through a few other guys and i got like you know seventy five thousand burn dvds <laughs> in my garage and i'm not even kidding bro See, between you and i the, the, the home i'm in and yours there's at least i'm not even gonna say it, it is an absurd amount absurd. of wrestling stuff and i can build a house out of dvds <laughs> <laughs> i'm Just serious do you still have VHS though, Lars? You know, I have a few left. I got rid of most of them just because I'd either burn them down, you know, yeah. to DVDs because it was just yeah. easier to store, you yeah. know. And but it's it's for me, it's like I I I had a hard time consuming wrestling on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the uh, way that we do it now. Like you can go on YouTube and and find a good match and the and you know and I'll find some underground shit that I really like like a lot of the deathmatch stuff, yeah. you'll it will find its way on onto YouTube, and a lot some of the Japanese stuff that I like every once in a while you you can you can you know find a match, but I remember when 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 the YouTube thing started to happen and the matches started or programs like. You know, WCW Saturday night from fucking, you know, December of 92 or whatever the fuck. <laughs> yeah. And it would be so fucked up that it was so hard to watch. But now people have been uploading better generations of this stuff and it's gotten easier to kind of consume it that way. Although I'm still sitting on, you know, fucking seasons upon season upon season of fucking raw and everything <laughs> yeah. else, you know. And, uh, you know, <coughs> I, I. I want to know, do you feel like, do you ever get overwhelmed by how much wrestling is out there now and how easy it is to, I mean, you think about every promotion that's, that's, that's got a TV show, whether it's through yeah. fight or just on regular television or through Peacock or whatever, but I mean, even though they hack those matches up, which is a shame. Mm-hmm. And I'm super glad that I got, with 80 million dvds with the actual real shit yeah yeah yeah. i mean the wwe has hacked even some of their own shit they've hacked it you know the the thing with it is and this is where they're getting me they're turning me to the dark side because something that i now am doing and i was never like this i used to enjoy a ghosty tv screen i used to like the second and third generations i now am collecting online versions of matches I already have and have seen a million times, but I want it in 720p. I want it in 1080. I want it the most beautiful, crisp sound of the fans popping for stuff. I want to elevate. Like, if I could find a Bachmigal Kurt Henning, that's where the network is a blessing because they have they have upgraded all of that stuff that I had before Right. On tape, on DVD, but it didn't look that clean. Buddy Rose and Doug Summers, second Doug Summers reference of the show against the Rockers. That's great now with the with the blood and the, the fans of the showboat. So like that is something I'm really enjoying. And now the Japanese companies are getting into it. So now all Japan and, and all this other stuff, they are putting out streaming networks. So I found the Toriumon, there's a Toriumon 12 man four team match in 2003 they just put that up on whatever tori mons thing is and it's for free even so you can go on there and watch a match that i've only ever had on dvds in third generation form but you can now see it in crisp clean color and, and, and picture and i love that so pros and cons absolutely but i do love the streaming that is even better and plus there's these 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 fans who are the real heroes they're taking all the ecw shows in perfect quality on the network and they're putting in the old music to it so then you could watch it and i literally had a wb wrestler who will remain nameless hit me up like hey do you got any versions of because like, I'm like yo it's your network but yes these things exist there's people that now take that stuff put the good music to it and they 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 find a way to get it to you and you, you cannot, I will go back and watch 94 and 95 ECW TV in particular, and it's unbeatable to me. It's yeah. a place in my life. It's the promos. It's Cactus. It's Sandman. It's Raven. 
it's Dean and Eddie and Redacted and Psychosis and Ray Jr. and the whole gang. And it's a lot of fun to go watch. But, and the music is so key yeah. because you got Alice in Chains and you have, you know, all these other, I was a grunge kid. So I always liked that music as it was happening at the time. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Who's J. Ruben Damager? I'm going to find that. So I like, even the, uh, the underground and undercurrent of hip hop was kind of Paul Lee or Maddie in the house, whoever's the music guy coordinated it. They had that down. So that's fun to me to go look at. But yeah, the streaming is cool because, again, I like the quality. But I also miss the idea of, like, we have a friend, Will. And Will, he was the compilation master. He would do, like, a Tracy Smothers comp or a Barry Windham comp or a Dick Murdoch comp or a Dick Togo comp or anybody else in the Alphabet Super Wrestling. And you'd watch it, and it was just so fun to have everything in the same place. And that's kind of missing now. You can't get that same vibe off of well, Google Drive. Yeah, I'm, and that's one of the things. Like, I've been re-watching the Hitman or the the Heart Foundation set that he put out. Mm -hmm. And it takes you from the very get-go of the story. And, you, and you're like, oh, yeah, that little thing that happened that sprung board this to happen. And then so on and so on and so forth. And now Bret Hart's a bad guy or whatever. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's, 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 it's like amazing to see. It's like a history lesson. Yeah. Or, but that's the thing. It's like if you go on to Peacock, they've edited these matches. They've edited these shows to the point to get them down to a nice fine two and a half hours or whatever with yeah, commercial sure. breaks. So it, it kind of takes the piss out of it in a lot of ways because those little idiosyncrasies that we look for or don't see the first time around or we study as a fan are no longer there. Yeah, and, and that's the sad thing too. And they own everything. And I just said to a friend the other day, I'm like, why is none of the worldwide wrestlings from the 80s been uploaded? WCW Saturday Night can fuck off. Well, well I all... got I got all the worldwide wrestling stuff. So if fucking WWE needs them, I got them all downstairs. I have them too. I'm just saying I want it in crisper clean. Going yeah, back yeah. to my crisp clean quality. And, and yeah. I then would get someone to put in Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Valiant's music and the right. Night Express's music and you know Giorgio Moroder and all that fun stuff and <laughs> old time rock and roll for Dusty and I would just like to have it because it seems like they put the even superstars and challenge which were the flagship of that company in the eighties they don't seem to value that to get it I mean I think there was a legal thing with the superstars but still get that on the network of Peacock and I just think that and I could have worked there when I left WWE they're like. Again, hey, kid, you're not coming to the performance center, but you think you're really valuable in the library. You can edit it. it. Did not interest me at the time. So I was so excited to work one on one with people where I was like, eh. and also the money would be less than I was making. And it was Connecticut, which is extremely expensive. So it wasn't going to work for me. But sometimes, for half a second at least, I sit and I think, well, I could have watched all the worldwides. <laughs> Even if they <laughs> never got put out, I could have seen the Masters for fuck's sake, but I didn't do it anyway. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that it's – when we were younger, the only way we could consume – I had the wrestling dolls or the guys or the action figures or whatever. I didn't have all of them, but I had enough, and I had the magazines. My dad would go, and my mom hated it. You know, we weren't rich or anything. My dad would be like, here's two bucks for that magazine. And you go, and you get the wrestler, and you get Inside Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And these were the ways to supplement – Every Saturday when you tune in in the morning to watch a wrestling. Whereas now, my God, the kids can just, they could consume wrestling at every second of the day with YouTube and everything else. So, you know, I, I could see how it could make someone more fanatical about being a, a fan, which is a good thing. But it's also an overwhelming thing, to get back to your question, where it is overwhelming. And even though I have all this information in my brain for certain periods of times, ask Will. I don't watch full matches. I am the king of getting to what I want to watch when I want to watch it and, and knowing what clips I like. And that's it. That's not because I don't like long matches. It's just my attention span ain't what it used to be. So I just really, I can't watch it like I used to. So I just watch, if I want to watch a tender match, I'm going to go to where he's chopping or punching the shit out of the guy. Maybe the enemy power bombs. And that's all I really need. I'm fine. But like everything else, you know, these people that are like, even the long matches these days, I know we're not going to talk too much about current wrestling, but like long matches, not for me. And I get that people well, do I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm with you because I mean, I was looking at that FTR, uh, Big Bill, uh, 
what the fuck's his name? Brian Cage. Brian Cage. That match should have ended with the fucking uh, the Doomsday, you know, or yeah. the, the the Bulldog or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. It should have ended there. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and but they carried it on, carried it on. Yes. Yeah, so I'm with you, Dennis. I'm sorry. So listening to all this, my question here is: What are not best matches? Not 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 worst matches what are your favorite entertaining matches if you were like hey fans you want to know what i like here are the matches that make me feel like i love wrestling again what are your you how many you ever give me a couple that i and should I'll add to this that i got in the mail so i'll even add to the question to make it for the show so one of the first things was i needed to see dr death steve williams against kenta kobashi from either late august 93 or early September 93. The classic, the one with the backdrop drivers. You know the one. So I had to see that one, you know? And I remember getting the tape in the mail and excitedly running and putting it in the VCR and watching it. And it was awesome. And I watched it and I took it to my best pal who wasn't in wrestling. He liked the Warrior in the 80s, but he didn't really care for wrestling too much. But I'm like, oh, but this was a five-star match. And I took it to his house and him and his dad were like, turn this shit off. Like, what is this? This is boring. I'm like, oh, my God. And that's when I learned about the Uber wrestling fan over here that sees what we see and the people that are just like, all right. <laughs> it's just like not, <laughs> not going to be for everybody, which is fine. But uh, so that's one uh, life-changing moment when I got my first Best of Sabu tape. I, I don't know if I can accurately convey to you. <sighs> Watched wrestling since 1985. Got all the magazines. Had seen Sabu in the magazines. Had seen some wild stuff in the magazines. But until... Had seen Juchin Liger. But until I got that Best of Sabu tape in 1993 with matches against the first match he had with Taz in the arena for ECW. I liked him doing the moonsault at Kawasaki Stadium on Dr. Luther and breaking the facial bones. And then all of these things, I was just like, oh, my God. Like, I didn't know wrestling could be like this. This is this is when, like, Boink the Clown is fighting with Bret Hart and, it, and Shockmaster's fall. Hey, there you go. Shockmaster's falling through the wall <laughs> and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, Road Warrior Hawk against the Equalizer. But then you see Sabu and you're like, oh, my God, this has been missing. So then it's like fucking catnip where you're like, I need to get more of this Sabu stuff. And you just go to – I have probably like 17 best of Sabu tapes. I was just so enamored. Went to go see him against Cactus Jack the next year in Pennsylvania. So anything Sabu did when I started into knowing that this existed, like Lars was saying, when you knew there were people, you could put your name out there and they'll send you tape lists. But you weren't going to get fucking Hollywood video and a Coliseum home video for $59.99 in the magazines for a best of King Kong Bunny and Big Don Stud. You were getting Sabu. You were getting the Headhunters. You were getting the best of Juchin Liger. You were getting the best of Great Buddha. And it was, it was like, you, you didn't know this. It seems so stupid, but like my brain in 1992 or three didn't know it could be like that. Like these things were available. Okay, cool. Sign me up. Yeah, I feel like there was one commercial tape with Japanese wrestling on it. And it was, uh, my God, what was it? There was. I one... remember one was at my video store where it was called World Pro Wrestling, and it had Anoki and yes. the Barbarian and Doctor yes. Death. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, yeah. and I remember that. So I guess for my last question, Rob, because we've been, you know, obviously to many pro wrestling matches, uh, we've been to events together. Um, I definitely know where, like, my favorite event has gone to. So it's a two part question. Okay. If if there's one underrated wrestler who hasn't got his flowers like you feel like he's meant to or her, that's my first question. The second half of that of the, of my last question would be, what was the event that you went to live personally that will, you will always carry that memory for the rest of your life? So first question, please. First question. Said his name earlier, Superboy. I think more people need to watch Superboy. Superboy was this roly poly luchador, great base, would fly around for all the other wrestlers. I think he was really good. Superboy is a good answer for that. So I say literally anyone else, they're like, that guy's not that good. Uh, Superboy is a good answer. Uh, 
And Manny Fernandez is kind of an asshole out of the ring, allegedly, so I'm not going to put him over too hard. But uh, Superboy is definitely the one I'll put over with a smile on my face. So then outside of that, my favorite event ever was Kobashi and Joe. Kobashi and Joe, I think it was October 1st, 2005, the New Yorker Hotel, just like a little ballroom, and it was just magical to be in that building for that match and for everyone to come alive like they did all at the same time for them guys fighting that was the best that that's the one that stays with me well one one of the things i do definitely want to do is now that you phil or excuse me phil rob has your email dennis yes maybe yes. when we post about this show maybe uh rob if you wanted to you could give us 10 matches and we could post it in the post like, hey, these are, you know, because I mean, maybe because I feel like it would be in spirit of this show. and We could maybe put it in our in, in the post. Yeah. You know, yeah, watch even, this stuff. Yeah. Even if match it's of a, the week. Even even if it's just like you typing it on a, a thing in a screenshot and we put it on the <laughs> next thing. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like it's a I'll double. I'll do it panel. on an index card like I used to with Mayfield to make it. Yeah. That would be fucking, that would be amazing. <laughs> Because I really honestly feel like there's stuff that I, you know, and uh, on on a total sidebar, there's stuff like, like I said before in the show, I'll call Rob and I'll say, hey, you know, I remember this video of like CM Punk, Samoa Joe, best of three. I can't remember what it was. I think there was a shoot in interview. And, you know, was it all in one, you know, tape? And he goes, no, actually it was, they did a shoot. <laughs> It was together and they talked about these matches and maybe somebody spliced them, but it's like, you know, it, 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 there's so much that I still learn from Rob to this day, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, I, I, I consider him a friend, you know, and uh, first and foremost, but as a historian, Rob, like, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to our show because. Oh, I, you're, thank this, you. This, you guys are this, too nice. Well, no, this was exciting for me because I really feel like, you know, bringing you on, I feel like, you know, I'm showing you off a little bit. So, you know. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Uh, oh, no. No, I, I, I thank you because you know about, you know, time on Honda and you've seen a lot of stuff live that I'm not even hit to, which is because you're a worldly individual that goes places. Whereas, <laughs> you know, I'll see stuff in the tri-state area, occasionally in the Midwest, but that's a show. I don't know if you've done it yet. You do a show about things you've seen, and I, I'm, I'm tuning into that shit because well, you know, you've seen, it's, seen it's a lot. Fun. Yeah, I have, and it's funny because it's like I just went through all these pictures, and I found like me and Tim with Masawa, and me yeah. and Timon Honda, and me and you know fucking Ultimo Dragon or whatever, you know, just the, all the shows I went to over in Japan, and these guys that I ran across, and some of them are are, are no longer with us, like Bison Smith. You know what I mean? He was he was a fucking you know he wrestled in Noah and he also learned here in 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 the Bay Area at APW. So it's like you know I have all these memories and it's I it, and it's like basically I have to compile a lot of this stuff because it's spread out and as I'm sure you know. Um, but yeah, I mean it, this has just been an awesome show for me just to have you on and I'm hoping people you know really like who are super fans like us. You know, take a look at this match list because I'm gonna do it. You're you're gonna put it up now. I'm now, go I'm, now I need to make something real good. Okay, well I I'll do that. But I have one last question for you. I know we're gonna extend this. Have you seen live wrestling in Arena Mexico, Curricken Hall, and also Madison Square Garden? I'm gonna guess yes. I think you said no, but have you seen no. a show in Arena Mexico? I've never seen a show in Arena Mexico. I've seen wrestling in. I've never been to MSG for wrestling. Wow. I've only been Learning. the first the first time I was ever I haven't in either, that, by the way. I haven't either, by the way. So it's but it's something that I gotta do. I was gonna go out there one time when Punk was headlining when he was and I something happened. I don't even remember what it was. The only time I've ever actually been in that building is when we played. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so um and but I've been to Kirkin Hall more times nice, you know, than I can I can remember, honestly. I remember it's uh smoking cigarettes with uh with two cold scorpio outside the front door <laughs> and we're just having a laugh you know and he was just like yo you, where are you guys from and i was like we're I'm, you know from san francisco we're in a band or whatever and we're smoking cigarettes together it was it was awesome he was smoking these long ass marble 100s but anyway <clears throat> dennis uh rob wow uh i'm glad that i got to get to know you uh hopefully we can turn this into a friendship see i'm doing hey. the experience thing wow. Uh, listen, where can people find you? 
Oh yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's Rob Daler N I N, and uh, that's all. I'm on there, and I, you'll, if you go and find me, just you'll see a bunch of wrestling pictures and wrestling clips. It's basic. That's it. Wow, Rob, episode three eighty five. We're really excited, that Lars. You see, he's got the numbers down. Three eighty five. We're excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Don't be a stranger. All right, you can't come back anytime, but you can come back sometime. Is that all right? Sounds good, Lars. So, all right, uh, Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Furrow. This is a Wrestling Perspective podcast. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media. We're changing our email address up, so look for us posting it uh, pretty much when this drops. We'll have posts coming out about what our new email address is. Feel free to email us your questions. Rob, you can't. Uh, you have our personal, so you can just text us or email us. But uh, I don't want to see you slide into my email, okay, buddy? <laughs> um, but look for all that stuff. Thank you so much, everybody, for enjoying the show, for consuming it. I know we're not uh, we're not uh, WWWF, but we're close to it. So thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>